So what the hell is cesium, and why would anyone want to make it? Well, it's a metal, and it's very reactive. Indeed, it'll catch fire, even when it's just exposed to air. Catch my answer if possible. And it'll explode in water. Okay. Yeah, cesium gets your attention pretty quickly, and believe me, it gets your attention a lot quicker if you've got to handle it too. Now, for over a year, I've been studying the explosions of alkali metals and water. Yes. Mainly because it shouldn't happen. It's a mystery. It just shouldn't happen. In chemical terms, it's what we call a heterogeneous reaction. Basically, all of the metal is here, and all of the water is here, and they can only react on the interface. Further, when they do react, they follow this general equation of the alkali metal, that's lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, or cesium, plus water, that's H2O, gives the alkali hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And that hydrogen gas will tend to keep these two reagents separate. And that's essentially what you're looking at here. So why then do these things spontaneously explode like that? And it should be noted that these explosions can happen even when the metal is entirely underwater. So the burning of the hydrogen just isn't a factor here. In fact, you can actually see that the hydrogen burns off at a later point. Like a good example of a heterogeneous boom maker would be gunpowder, where you mix up potassium nitrate and what is essentially carbon but you have to grind it very finely. That's why it's called gun powder. If you start off with just, say, potassium nitrate and a block of carbon and just put a match to them, it will never explode because the reagents can only react on the interface. So why is it when you have, say, a lump of potassium and liquid water that they explode? And anyone who tells you this is well understood is simply talking crap or hasn't actually thought this one through. Anyway, so if you're studying these explosions, most of the alkali metals, notably lithium, sodium, and potassium, are relatively cheap. Cesium, however, is bloody expensive. Indeed, its price is comparable to uh, cocaine or gold or, well, cesium, depending on what your vice is. Now, that can actually be a significant barrier to doing this work in that if the stuff that you're exploding is as expensive as gold, eh, makes this a pretty expensive explosion to study. So basically, if you want a load of cesium metal, you're going to have to make it yourself. But how? Maybe something outdoorsy. Well, it turns out that cesium boils relatively low, just below 700 degrees Celsius. So this is cesium metal distilling around a glass tube in an inert argon atmosphere. And curiously, if you do the same with potassium, it goes green. Potassium, which distills just above 700 degrees, gives a green gas. Cesium, however, has no obvious colour to it. Odd that. Anyway, you can distill cesium at just below 700 degrees Celsius. That's about the temperature at which metal is starting to glow red hot. Further, it turns out that if you add lithium to cesium chloride, which is quite cheap, you can just distill off the cesium metal. Okay, so that's the easy bit. The more difficult bit is even at room temperature, this stuff bursts into flames in air, and it'll explode in contact with water. So how are you going to distill it? Well, firstly, obviously you need to keep all of the air out of it, and ideally have a gas that won't react with either cesium or lithium. 
Now it turns out lithium will react with the nitrogen in the atmosphere to give lithium nitride, and cesium burns in the air to form the oxide. So you can't really use oxygen or nitrogen. <laughs> That's kind of a problem, since our atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen and about 20% oxygen. So in this case, I fill up the kit with argon before I start. Uh, argon, as we all know, can easily be found in the pink balloons. Now, running a distillation at 700 degrees Celsius has certain problems. So, for instance, you can't use anything in the kit that will melt or burn or alloy with any of the metals in the kit. Now, it turns out that stainless steel is okay, and brass and copper seem to survive all right as well, although I wouldn't have been able to tell you that without actually running the experiment. Oh, and uh, one last fun fact. The stainless steel container that I used here to distill the cesium started out its life in all sincerity as a soap dispenser. Okay, so this is now basically the experimental setup. What I've got here is a stainless steel container with a brass adapter and then just some more brass fittings here. This whole thing is now airtight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up my uh, cesium chloride and lithium here the cesium will then distill over into this. I've just got this grill here to stop the coals, just to keep them physically contained. The cesium distills at about 700 degrees, which is very similar to the temperature the glass melts at. So the previous problem that I had is that I needed to have this at 700 degrees, not have this at 700 degrees. So I've now got, in principle, two pieces of metal, but it's really three because there's the grill on the other side that will hopefully provide some heat shielding to keep the temperature of this vial down. Not quite sure how it'll work. And first we want 50 grams of cesium chloride. I want to add two and I five grams of lithium. So I want three, one five for that. Okay. Seems like a mirror. I think I can see the liquid in the bottom. Look at it, it's got shitloads of this stuff. So the golden the yield, the expected yield of this is about 20 grams. So you might be able to see it there. It looks like there's something in the bottom, yeah, the liquid. You still see? Oh, you see it burning, yeah. Feels good. Looks beautiful. So, be careful here. So that we preserve as much of our atmosphere as possible. Oh, fuck. Okay. That is my cesium metal. Oh, it's beautiful. That's my cesium metal. Beautiful, eh? Now I'm getting the rest of that out of there because there's still quite a lot in there. Okay. Holy fucking oh. shit! 